Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Matti Lassas from uh, Finland, from Helsinki. Matti uh, is an academy professor at the Department of Mathematics and Statistics at the University of Helsinki. He got his education from the University of Helsinki, where he, all, he did his undergraduates and his PhD. And he then held several research and faculty positions uh, in Helsinki, as well as MSRI in Berkeley. Mati received several awards and academic recognitions, including an invited talk at the last ICM in Rio. Uh, he is an elected member of the Finnish Academy of Science and Letters in 2012, and he received the Calderon Prize in 2007. Mati's research is in inverse problems, um, characterized, I would say, by really substantial contributions that go all the way from theory computation to applications of inverse problems in other disciplines as well as industry. And today he will talk about inverse problems for nonlinear hyperbolic and elliptic equations. And I really look forward to your presentation. Mati, over to you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so, Carla, thank you very much for for invitation for this, and also for, for, the, for the other organizers. I think this is very important for our community to have this type of seminar. So, thank you for for your efforts running this. So, today I'm speaking about inverse problems, both for hyperbolic and elliptic equations, paying attention to attention to nonlinearity. And uh, I will give an overview and try to emphasize that uh, inverse problems for nonlinear equations are often easier than uh, inverse problems for linear equations. Anyhow, let me first start uh, from, from uh, linear, linear equations, the linear wave equation, where the problem is like in this picture, that uh, we have some unknown medium that we want to image. There are some boundary sources, that sends acoustic waves in this picture. They are interacting with the medium for the reflecting, and then they return back to the boundary where they are, those are measured. And uh, when, in the case when the medium is anisotropic, we have to model the wave speed by using a matrix. So we could uh, consider a domain M in Rn, where N is typically two or three, and I denote by new the unit normal vector of the boundary. The unknown uh, wave speed is modeled by a matrix value function G. So the speed of waves uh, depends, where the, but depends on the direction where the waves are propagated. And we consider this uh, wave equation with matrix valued wave speed. And uh, I denote the solutions by U or U with index F to indicate the boundary source that produces these waves. So the boundary source can be modeled by a Neumann boundary condition. So the normal derivative of the solution is equal to F. And we assume always that waves one is at time t is equal to zero. The boundary measurements are defined by using the Diedler to Neumann map or Neumann to Diedler map, like in this problem, where the source F, the Neumann boundary value, is mapped to the boundary value of the solution. The inverse problem is to uh, is to study the problem, can we determine the wave speed G in local coordinate charge when the Neumann to Dirle map is given. So what this means in practice? One could think in, uh, the medical imaging with ultrasound uh, device, so standard medical ultrasound imaging, where a doctor has an emitter at one boundary point and send waves. In reality, the waves are traveling along, along paths that are curved. But the imaging algorithm assumes that the waves have traveled along straight lines. So we then we obtain a picture in non-Euclidean coordinates, the coordinates that are associated to wave propagation. And if one wants to get different images from the body, one changes the location of the emitter. So in this way, we can think that the imaging of a metric in local coordinate charge is that we do ultrasound imaging with varying uh, locations of the imaging device. And all, all locations of the, bound, of, the, of the imaging device on the boundary gives a local chart. To consider this problem more mathematically, we say that the man domain M is actually a manifold, and there is a metric tensor G, 
that is coordinate invariant in, in a way that it transfers systematically when we move from one chart to another. To formulate this problem more geometrically, uh, we consider now abstract Riemann M manifold with a metric tensor G that is given in local charts just by a matrix. And we consider the geometric wave equation when we have second time derivative minus Laplace operator associated to the metric. And this uh, Laplace operator is given by this formula here. So it is written this way so that it transforms nicely when we go for, from one coordinate chart to another. But in practice, it is actually this operator here where we have the second order terms uh, have coefficient that is given by this G with uh, upper indices. This is the inverse of the metric tensor plus then some lower order terms. Again, the deal to Neumann mapping maps the Neumann data, the normal derivative of the solution to boundary value of the solution. And in particular, if we have the more standard wave equation with the scalar value wave speed C of x, this corresponds to Riemannian metric that is given by function C of x to power minus two times identity matrix. And the, the inner inverse problem is now that we assume that the boundary of the manifold is given. Also the Neumann to Dirichlet map is given. So we actually have to assume that the boundary is given so that we can speak about Neumann to Dirichlet map. And then we ask, can we determine the manifold and the metric up to an isometry? In practice, this means building local coordinate charts where we have uh, images of the metric tensor and then we glue together these pictures. So here are our very short history and, and from particular point of view for inverse problems for linear wave equation. The uniqueness for the inverse problem with the scalar uh, valued wave speed in Rn was studied by using boundary control method by Berishev and Berishev and Kurilev when they combined their method with Tatarov's unique continuation result. So it came a little bit later. Also in 92, uh, the spectral problem for, uh, for that is equivalent to the wave imaging problem was studied in setting of a manifold by Belichev and Kurilev. From the point of view of this talk, I mentioned that um, there's a solution method that's based on focusing of the waves. So we focus waves so that they are almost like point sources. And um, by the Hoop and Kepli and Oxenen, this method was developed further to make it possible to make it, it a numerical method that focuses waves and uses this focusing to do image. Now, all of these results have the same restrictions. It is that they require Tatarus unique continuous result. And this result requires that the metric is time independent in practice, or more generally, it is real analytic in time variable. There are counter examples when the unique continuation fails when the metric is, 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 is arbitrary time depending function, or even the lower over order terms are time depending. So there's no, there's, it's very difficult to consider uh, uh, time depending wave speeds for linear wave equation. And also these methods are typically very unstable. And those were the main result met motivations to study inverse problems for nonlinear equation. And the idea is to use interaction of waves, like in this picture, we have four waves that are interacting, or we have three waves that are interacting. And we are going to use the nonlinearity as a tool that helps us to solve the inverse problem. So let's consider this model. Let me first start from this kind of very practical question. Is this important from a practical point of view? I would say yes, because this kind of principle is already used in medical imaging in the quantitative elastography. What happens there? One has unknown domain that one you want to image. You have an ultrasound source that sends elastic P wave. And the, you use the ultrasound to focus the P waves close to some point. And if the focusing is strong enough and amplitudes are high enough, this produces a shear wave. So there is some nonlinear process that takes place. The shear wave starts to propagate and you can image it by using ultrasound or you obtain the boundary measurements. So this is a practical application that is tested in medical imaging uh, in, in realistic settings. Uh, and here are some of the papers where these pictures are taken from. 
was over to emphasize that these metrics that I'm going to speak about today, they already have been used to nonlinear uh, elastic medium by the hoop, Woolman, and Wang. So this kind of uh, practical imaging problem where people traditionally consider ultrasound and shear waves as, as two different waves, even though they are just different uh, polarizations of elastic wave, that can be considered as inverse problem for nonlinear equations. Okay, let me formulate the mathematical model that is very simple but uh, captures essential features of nonlinear uh, inverse, inverse problem for nonlinear equations. Then we consider the nonlinear wave equation where we have the scalar wave operator box G plus then a nonlinear term that is u to the power m. Here. The, non -linear, the linear wave operator is defined by just using the same formula that one uses to, 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 to define Laplacian or Riemannian manifold. But now we have a Lorentzian man manifold. So we have Lorentzian metric which I values. Uh, are such that one eigenvalue is negative, others are positive. So this equation becomes hyperbolic. So here it is kind of alternative practical model that you could also consider that is very similar that we could also study. We have in Euclidean space where I have considered the variables, I have you know, t by time by t and uh, the space variables by y. That would be in space time one plus three. So the dimension is that one time dimension, three space dimensions. We would have a Euclidean wave operator with time depending wave speed plus then some nonlinear term, some non normalizing function A times u to the power m. And also I use sources that are inside the medium to avoid problems related to boundary. This alternative model, this corresponds to the metric that is given by, uh, by diagonal metrics. So sorry, here should be diagonal. That has the elements uh, minus one c to power minus two c to power minus two c to power minus two, where c is this base speed. So this is a diagonal matrix that has uh, eigenvalues. One is negative, and others are positive. Let me consider this concept of, of uh, some, some definitions for Lorentzian manifolds a little bit more in detail. So I didn't want to formulate some uh, notations. So let us assume that we have a Lorentzian manifold, which just means that the metric is semi-definite. So an example is the Minkowski space here, when we have, uh, I use the geometrical uh, actually habit to uh, denote the coordinates with upper indices. So we have a coordinate x0, that is the time, and the space coordinates are x1, x2, x3. And we have Lorentzian metric, that is the diagonal matrix, minus one, 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 one. So we have this type of semi-definite metric. Then uh, I consider the tangent space, that is the space of all vectors that has base point at x. And, and, and then we consider the light form. So we say that the vector having, uh, having, uh, uh, having the base point here at the origin, this is light-like. If the quadratic form is defined by this, the Lorentzian metric, then we evaluate it by at the point x i, x i gives zero. So in this case, we say that the vector is light like. Physically, it means that xi is tangent vector to the light cone. So when you go to the direction of, of xi, then you propagate along light cone. This is why it is light like. Then we say that xi, vector xi is time like if this inner product defined by g is negative. This means that the vector is pointing inside the light cone. And moreover, we say that the curve is time-like if it's tangent vector at all points is time-like. So what it means, it is like a red curve here in this picture. It moves always inside the light cone. So its speed is slower than speed of, of, of light. So this corresponds to a particle that has a mass and moves uh, with a speed that has le is less than speed of light. One more notation, I collect all future pointing uh, 
and light light vectors. So all vectors that are tangent to light cone is yellow cone, but they are tangent, uh, sorry, they're tangent to it and are pointing to forward, forward di future direction. This is denoted by this L plus XM. So these notations we will be using. There are a few more def definitions. So we use geodesics. So typically light ray, the path of light ray is a geodesic in Lorentzian space. And it satisfies the same equation as, Laurent, uh, as uh, geodesics in Riemannian geometry, only that the, the metric is semi-definite metrics. Then we need to have a, some regularity assumption that is very similar. Then we say that in, uh, in Riemannian geometry that the manifold is complete. And that is used, defined by using uh, the past and the future of a point. So if P is the point here that in this picture is at the origin, the causal future is all points in space-time that are in the future of, of P. So points that are inside the light cone. And uh, J minus is the causal past. So those are all points that are in the insert the past light cone. By using this uh, future and past concepts, we can define the concept of global hyperbolicity. So this is almost by saying that the manifold is complete. So we say that manifold is globally hyperbolic if two properties are valid. First, there are no closed causal curves. So this means that there's no time traveling in this space time. Second is that if I look the, the causal diamonds, the, ca oh, sorry, the causal diamonds are intersection of a, of a future of one point, like in this picture, future of this point uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the tip of the cone and an and, and intersection with the past of other point. So we have intersection of point P1, sorry, intersection of future of point P1 and past of P2. So it looks in space time like this type of diamond. If these sets are compact to all points, this just means that the space time has no holes uh, or that that it has uh, that that no this type of cone can touch the boundary of the universe. So if these two conditions are valid, then the manifold is globally hyperbolic, and in, the name comes from the fact that on this type of manifolds you can solve wave equation uniquely. And geometrical fact is that if manifold is globally hyperbolic, then it can be represented as a product of time axis and some space with time varying metric. So this makes the manifold to have very nice structure for our purposes. Okay, so here is a result that we proved with, with Kurilev and Ullmann and then extended by Ullmann and, and Wang to have the following form, which says that we can uh, solve inverse problems uh, in, in four dimensional space times. So we have one time dimension, three space dimensions. We assume throughout the talk that the manifolds that we consider are globally hyperbolic, and then we ask him that we have a curve mu, like in this picture, the my beam pictures, space is vertical direction, sorry, space is horizontal direction, time is vertical direction. So we have a path, for instance, you would think that you are in space and you have a spaceship. And, and the spaceship, when time, time goes forward, then the road of the spaceship in space time is a curve. So you have a spaceship that is with road in space time is modeled by world line new, and you do measurements in, in its neighborhood V. So we have point P1 and P2 that are the, like the space time at uh, some given time, like T is equal to one, and then we have the spaceship at time T is equal to two for instance. Then we consider local measurements in this neighborhood V. We define the source to solution map for this nonlinear wave equation, we have the wave operator for the, this uh, metric G plus nonlinear term U to the power two. And we have sources F, where F is supported in this neighborhood V. And the, also the sources are small. So that we have existence for this nonlinear equation. We define the source to solution map that maps the source in V here to the restriction of the solution in V. So we we have this spaceship, the spaceship uh, creates some sources, it sends waves, the waves propagate somewhere, return back, and then we record the waves 
within close to the wave ship, uh, spaceship. So everything, all observational sources are in V. But it turns out that we can reconstruct, if you know the V and this sort of solution map, we can reconstruct the space time in this large causal diamond. So this is the set where the waves can propagate and return back to the area where we can do, uh, do measurements. And this is done up to a change of coordinates. So this was done some years ago. This, these are already years when the papers came out as publications. Uh, and um, now I'm going to speak generalization of this result. But let me first explain the idea. The idea is that we are in four dimensional space time. We are going to use fourth order interaction. So interaction of four waves to introduce artificial point sources. So we consider the case when we have four plane waves, for instance, we send them together. I will show you soon the video. And when they collide, they create an artificial point source. Actually, they are microlocal point sources because we can only analyze their singularities. So let's look how this goes. The, this, okay, now, now the waves start to propagate. Soon they start to interact. Nothing happens. But at some point, all these four plane waves interact at the same point of space time. They interact like now. And then for this point where they interacted, they have a sudden point source that sends a spherical wave that goes to all directions. So why this is useful? This is useful because for arbitrary point of space time, we can create an artificial point source. And we can fill the unknown space time with interior sources. So we have unknown vacuum, for instance, but we, we somehow send their waves and we can fill it with, with point sources. We move from the, the sources from very limited area to everywhere in the unknown medium. And then we use these observations to do image. So we, we use the interaction of four plane waves to create point sources. And these point sources, they, they determine uh, the metric, uh, rough, roughly speaking, in the, in the causal diamond that is set where the wave can propagate and return back to the area where we do observations. So this is what we did in 2018 and before that. Now we have a new technique. So let me first say some words about, about this. We also had this black uh, conic wave that appears here. And earlier we thought that that is just a noise and we wanted to get rid of it. But now it turned out that this is very useful and it can be used to imaging also. Uh, so we have now two results that are, are, are based on the uh, interaction with waves of, in, 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 uh, of, of, of only three waves. And this is much, much simpler pro technique. And we can now apply this to one and n dim one plus n dimensional space times where n is any number larger than two. So again, let's see, look, consider similar setting. We have a, a, this globally hyperbolic space time of now arbitrary dimension where n is larger than two. We have a time like curve from point P1 to P2 and its neighborhood. And then we consider this nonlinear equation with arbitrary power m. Then we consider the source to solution map that maps source supported in this small neighborhood v to solution restricted to v. And if the dimension and the metric are not both three, then this data determines the causal diamond. I go back here. We can define the metric Let's go here, inside this causal diamond. The picture here is just the same as earlier. And um, uh, in the case when n and m are three, then we can reconstruct the conformal structure of the metric. But a little bit more is even true. This method is much, much simpler. So this is actually a preprint from this month. We can also consider the case when the sources and, 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 and observations are separated. We could consider this type of case when sources are supported here in this domain omega in. So up is again here time axis, axis and, and, and a horizontal direction in space. So we have sources in omega in. We observe the waves in omega out. And, and also like, like, uh, like these are triangles here just mean that, uh, that like this omega in may not be in the past of this point. So first we can somehow generalize this, the earlier result and the observations 
uh, are in different sets where the sources are. And also we can consider a uh, Lorentzian metric that depends, uh, that, sorry, that's, uh, we can consider quasi-linear equations. The Lorentzian metric that depends on the parameter S, and then we consider equation where we substitute uh, into this Lorentzian metric uh, that depends on parameter, the value of the solution. So we can consider this type of quasi-linear equation. We have to assume that this equation is genuinely nonlinear. So this doesn't work to linear equations. So in this geometrical setting, when we define the source to solution map for this, uh, this uh, nonlinear equation, then we can determine the conformal class of the metric with the value when, when here we substitute here the, the place of u, the value zero. So this is of course, because we consider small sources f, then u is small. So anyway, we can only reconstruct uh, the metric in, in the best case for small values of parameter s. The conformal class means that we have multiplied, we can, we can we, we obtain the metric tensor multiplied by, by some, some unknown function. This is a very natural thing because if, if we multiply this equation with the scalar function, then in the region where f is equal to zero, like the equation still holds. So we can, this is basically best we could reconstruct. So how, where these results uh, somehow like originated? We had earlier results with Chen, Oxanen, and Paternine, where we used this interaction of three waves to do imaging of the lower order terms of the equation. We considered uh, the reconstruction of connection in the Higgs field equation. So in the Higgs field equation, we have this type of connection that is sum of the derivatives plus a matrix A. And we consider here we have this type of uh, linear wave equation with connection term plus then nonlinear potential term that comes from this uh, Mexican hat potential of, of, of Higgs field. So there we considered the flat space, the Minkowski space with this metric that is diagonal matrix minus one, 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 one. And we did consider the case when we do measurements in the cylinder of space time. So uh, ball in, in the space and then time interval product of those. And then we showed that we can reconstruct the connection in this maximal causal diamond D. So in the region where waves can propagate and return back. So we considered the source to solution map again for this equation with small sources supported in V. We observe the waves only in V and then we determine the connection up to natural gauge transformation. This is very similar if you have considered the classical inverse problem for, for sharing an equation with magnetic field then we can reconstruct um, uh, the A modulo of gradient term. So it's very similar to this case transformation that, that we already have encountered in, um, in, in study of classical inverse models. I want to point out that nonlinearity helps also here. That if, if this parameter kappa here that multiplies the nonlinearity is zero, then the problem is open. So that we can solve again a problem for nonlinear equation that is open for linear. Uh, linear wave equation. Let me explain a little bit the proofs of this. And now I try to somehow give really uh, this kind of uh, like in a very, very simple case the, the idea of the proof. So let us consider the wave, uh, nonlinear wave equation that where we have the wave operator plus u to power three. And uh, we consider now the mean of this space so that the wave operator is just a standard Euclidean wave operator. Now we consider solutions u that depends on three epsilon parameters, epsilon one, epsilon two, and epsilon three. <coughs> and we assume that when epsilons are zero, then the solution is zero. Then we do linearization. If we linearize once, so we take derivative with respect to single epsilon one, epsilon j parameter, like epsilon one. Then we see that the, this linearized solution satisfies the linear wave equation. And if we consider multiple linearization, we differentiate one with respect to all epsilon parameters, we obtain a function w. And when we differentiate this three times, we see that this third derivative is w, it satisfies the wave operator where we have a, a Euclidean wave operator of w is a product of these solutions u1, u2, u3. So there appears a source term here. 
So originally we didn't have any physical source, but now the interaction of the waves. So this product U1, U2, U3, this creates something that we call an artificial source produced by the nonlinear interaction. So how this looks like? Let us consider an example. In this example, now I use the uh, coordinates. We have T for time, and then Y1, Y2, Y1, Y2, Y3, two space waves. Even though this nonlinear equation cannot be studied with, with delta waves, let us anyway consider just linear waves that are delta waves. So I have like here the wave delta evaluated, the Dirac delta distribution evaluated at T minus Y1. So this is a plane wave that is supported on a plane in space time. And these other waves are similar. When I multiply them together, then I get the distribution, delta distribution on intersection of, of three planes, and intersection of three planes is a line. This line is actually given by, by this, that we have that the coordinates are such that all these y1, y2, y3 coordinates are equal to t. So we have a line in space time. And if we consider W that is the solution of this wave equation with source S, where S is product. Just one second. So when, when um, S is product of, of these uh, three waves, so that is the delta distribution, we have a source that is supported in line in space time. So line in, in space time actually is the path of, in space time of a moving point source. So we have a moving point source that moves in time. And at time t, the point source is located at point t, t, t. So we have the point, the point source that is continuously on, like an airplane that, that sends continuous radar signal and it moves along the path uh, in space time. So we have a distribution that is supported in this line, of, uh, line in space time. Let's look how the solutions look like. So here we have now these three plane waves that start to move. They are plane waves. Let's look what happens. So this is just a visualization of these delta waves. When the, uh, the, the planes start to intersect, when all of them intersect, they create a point in space time that is moving in, in, in time. And they, they, those, those create a point source. Like that. Now you see how this occurs. So my intuition here is that this is very similar that if you would have a uh, in, in uh, have an airplane that is flying with the speed that is higher than speed of, of, of speed, so hyper hypersonic airplane, it sends this kind of conical wave that is actually a shock wave. Now we don't have any shocks here, but we have still a conic wave. So we have a, a point source that is moving with the speed very very high speed, and it creates a conical wave. And now to use this three-wave interaction, we made an uh, in, uh, observation with, with Chen, Oxenen, and Paterlein, that if all these plane waves travel very close to each other, and then we a little bit vary the directions where the plane, plane waves come from, then we can create a, this kind of conical wave that goes to arbitrary dimension, uh, sorry, ar arbitrary direction. So even though, uh, like in this picture, it seems that this conical wave is going to just one direction, but if we change the directions of the plane waves, the direction of the conic wave changes uh, its somehow direction where it starts to propagate, and we can send waves to arbitrary direction. Here is a little bit different picture. Here we have three spherical waves that uh, that travel. So this is the spherical three spherical waves in uh, all pieces of spherical waves at some time t one. This is a little bit later when they started to interact. Then we come to the situation when all three of them interact. So actually what the interaction looks like, you could think that the interaction happens on a vertical line. There, in the vertical line, there will be two moving points or it's one moves up, one moves down. They move very, very fast. And then when they move very, very fast, they create this type of, 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 of a cylindrical wave. And the cylindrical wave travels to the directions where uh, where the original spherical waves came from. So this means that we can send plane waves, they inter so we can send spherical waves, they interact and send information back to us 
that's very good for illness products. So this is what we did in, 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 in Minkowski the space. Then with um, face mahamari and and, and, and allowed oxygen. So we need to prove this. Um, so for the proof of, of, of this result by face mahamari and oxygen to prove this, we consider now general Lorentzian space. And this slide is a little bit technical. I want to speak about very simple things next, but, but now this slide is a little bit technical. This is a general tool to consider nonlinear uh, hyperbolic equations. Namely, if we send, if we consider this model equation with third order nonlinearity, and we are in this observation set V, where we, we have points x, j, and we send geodesics along light like geodesics. Uh, so, sorry, we send uh, wave fronts that propagate along light like geodesics in space time. This journey is gamma j. And then they may interact, they, uh, they, uh, the journey intersect at point y and produce some singularities that may be detected at point z. So then we notice the following things. So we have two proper properties. First is that if these three geodesics don't intersect at all, then we don't observe any wave fronts at point z. This is a very natural thing. Then there is a result that follows very much the microlocal theory, how singularities interact. If uh, these three, if, if three uh, geodesics interact, intersect at point Y, that S1, S2, S3 be the parameters where the intersection happens, let's assume that Xi is a vector that is in the span of the velocity vectors of, of, of these geodesics in the intersection point, and also that it is lifelike. Then if you go from point y to direction xi along the geodesic, and we return back to the observation domain v, say that we come to point z, then it holds that we observe wave front in z. So when we send three wave fronts along these geodesics, they interact here, produce a wave front, and it's observed in z. So this holds for this model equation. But this, I, I believe it holds to very, very different types of wave equations. And now with face Mohammedi and, and Oxenin, we, we made a little bit abstract definition created to this. We defined the three to one scattering relation that we can see here in this picture. We say that uh, these three geodesics, gamma one, gamma three, gamma, gamma one, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, and the point Z have, uh, so they satisfy a relation R if we observe singularities at point Z when we send singularities along geodesics. Then one can somehow forget all this nonlinear equation, consider only this kind of scattering relation, and, and show that if these two properties are valid, then the relation R determines the conformal structure in this maximal diamond D. So what's the point here? The point is that this, this relation R, it can be defined um, just by using geometrical terms. And we have to uh, analyze the similarities in certain relatively simple cases. If those are valid, then we can apply this lemma to reconstruct the conformal structure of the metric. So this, this three to one scattering relation, and this is shown in this picture, this can be applied hopefully in the future to many different type of nonlinear hyperbolic equations of second order. Okay, so this was a little bit technical. Let me like go uh, more towards practical things. And let me ask that could we use the nonlinearity of the wave equations to help us also in the way that we could use very, very low resolution observations. Let me consider this question. So is this nonlinearity that it makes imaging robust? So very recently, and actually we just have a preprint now in ArcSIV, with Lee Matainen, Potenciano, and Machado, and Tuni, we prove the following result in Minkowski space. So we consider the model where we have a Euclidean wave operator. And then we add there a simple nonlinearity, a potential Q that depends both in space and time, times solution U to power M. And again, we consider here, uh, now we consider the boundary value. So we have a source F that produces the wave. 
one more thing about the geometry. So we just think a bounded domain in, in, uh, in Rn. Then we have two times T1 and T2 that are large enough. And then we assume that we do measurements with time interval zero capital T, where capital T is large enough. And then we consider any potential that is supported in omega times this time interval T1, T2. So this is relatively short time interval. This can be this arbitrary time interval with, with relatively large T1. And then we do measurements in much, much longer time interval. But then it turns out that it is, we don't need much information. Uh, we can consider the real valued, sorry, real valued nonlinear map that maps the, bound, the boundary source F or the Gridley boundary value to the inner product of the Neumann boundary value with one uh, function psi. So this psi is like instrument function, it models some instrument. So when we somehow send waves with different values of of f, then we have a simple instrument that only gives us one real number. So this measurement is very, very robust. It turns out that this determines the potential q uh, uniquely. Moreover, if we have a priori information that q is a smooth function with bounded norm, so c n plus one norm is bounded, then the reconstruction is held stable. So one dimensional measurement is enough to reconstruct uh, the potential Q, which basically means that we can somehow use very, very low quality, poor resolution observation instruments if we can precisely control the source F. How is this possible? So here is the idea of the proof. Let us consider the empty derivative of this our measurement map. So this measurement map is now real valued. It's in the product of, of instrument function psi and Neumann boundary value of the source. When we differentiate, this uh, m times, and we compute this differential to direction f1, f2, and so on. Then this is inner product of, of uh, m waves and some function v psi, where these vj's, they are solutions of the linear wave equation uh, with, with boundary value fj's. Also this v psi, this is a function that we have to engineer. It is not very complicated, but it will be a function that uh, satisfies the wave equation and its boundary value is, is psi. So this is actually the way how we create this instru suitable instrument function. Uh, uh, and we require that this v, uh, v psi is equal to one uh, in this time interval t1, t2 times omega. So in, print, in, in particular, this psi is a function that is constant on time interval t1, t2 and then it goes smoothly to zero. So when we have then uh, like these integrals, by varying these solutions of, of the linear wave equation, we see that we can find the partial random transform of the unknown potential multiplied by function one. So I emphasize that P psi is one in the domain where Q is supported. So it's just this integral, integral of Q times products of solutions of wave operator. And there are so many solutions that we can find the uh, random transform of, of Q in space variables, and this determines uh, the unknown potential. I emphasize that this kind of results have been studied, studied like this type of formula has already used in study by Hinch and, and Ullman and Tsai, where they used uh, the whole linear Neumann map, but they also were, also were able to consider the case when the wave speed is dry. This was also in ArcSIV in, in last month, so this is very rapidly closing field at, at this moment. Okay, so these same principles can be used also for nonlinear elliptic equations. Let me show one example result. So this uh, higher order linearization and interaction of solutions can be applied also to elliptic equations. And there are several results. Uh, now this is one of the uh, results in two dimensional case. So we have a compact and connected Riemann and manifold boundary uh, with, uh, so dimension is two. And then we consider this uh, nonlinear elliptic equation. And now both the metric G, the Riemannian metric G, and the potential Q are on unknown. Then we can, if you consider the Neumann, so the direct Neumann map for small boundary values Fs, then we can show that knowing only the boundary and the Neumann to direct Neumann map, 
Then we can determine the manifold, we can determine the conformal class of the metric and the potential Q up to a K transformation. So this is the two-dimensional result. Similar results in, uh, in higher dimensional case are studied in this paper that we did with Limatainen, and uh, Lin uh, and Salo. But also there was actually at the same time uh, Faiz Muhammadi and Oxenen uh, uh, studied this, uh, this uh, higher dimensional questions. And also very, very much after, very little after that, Kripchuk and Ullman proved results for, uh, for partial data problems. So what is here the, the proof? So let us first consider the zero, the first, first Fresh derivative of the Dirichlet Trojan mapping at zero. So this actually gives the Dirichlet Trojan map for the linear equation. Then by using our results with, with Ullman from 2001, this is the result where we can reconstruct the two-dimensional manifold from boundary data and the conformal class of the metric. Then we choose some representative from this conformal class. So we just choose some metric G hat, that is the original metric G, that is now matrix value tensor, or that's actually a tensor, that is multiplied by a scalar function H. And then we can assume that we know the Dirichlet to Neumann mapping for, for uh, metric G hat and some uh, potential Q. Then similar formula that we had earlier, this is again true. The M to fresh derivative of the boundary observations give inner products of, of, of M plus one solutions of the linear uh, Laplace operator times Q. Now we can do also very simple analysis. We choose all solutions V3, V4 and so on to be one. And we are left with inner product of Q and solutions V1 and V2. And then we can use this kind of results of products of solutions and determine Q. I want to emphasize that here this proof also is much, much easier than, than this kind of complicated proofs for uh, linear uh, elliptic equations. Namely, we all, all, all analysis is done to the solutions of the, the linear uh, equation without potential. So we can do one our own analysis in the case when Q is equal to zero. To put it very roughly, it's enough to consider the linearized inverse problems in the style of Calderon, and we don't require this fine, uh, this kind of like this technical uh, and deep results by Sylvester and Ullman. So this is one more from our example, how it shows that often inverse problems for linear equations are, sorry, inverse problems for linear equations are inverse problems for, for, uh, for linear equations. So nonlinearity helps in solving inverse problems. And I, I finish here. Here are some references to, to that I used in this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mati. It was really interesting. Um, lots of recent uh, work that you have done, Mati. Is this uh, due to the lockdown or was this before? Uh, oh, like, like, like actually, with, this was with, with Faith Mohammadi and Oxenen. This was a, long, was, was a longer project, but now we really were able to concentrate on that. Uh, also with this, where, like, so this, this lockdown really helps in somehow like, like doing a little bit more work. That's true, yes. yes it has been beneficial time. No, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, so if people have questions, please uh, raise your electronic hand, uh, which you can do by clicking, off, uh, by clicking on participants, and then there is an option. I can see that uh, Benjamin Palacios has a question. Oh, please. Fadil, can you unmute Benjamin? Okay, you are, you, you should be able to talk, Benjamin. You have to unmute yourself. Can we unmute him as well, Fadil? I think so, let's see. No, uh, I've already hit unmute. So Benjamin, you have to unmute yourself. Oh, yes. there we go. Hi, can Very you good. hear me? Oh yes, thank you. Oh uh, yeah, I actually I pressed the button by mistake. So uh, so far <laughs> I don't have a question right now. 
Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Let's get the manager still. So like, like, um, like I, mean, I would say that there are lots of open problems uh, like, like at this moment in this field in the sense that, for instance, this, uh, like this, we don't have any stability results yet. For, for, uh, we have only, only this one holder stability result. Actually, uh, I do have a question now. Uh, I was wondering if, because at some point in the talk, you, you said that um, the linear problem is still open and there was uh, some parameter kappa that was controlling the, the size of the nonlinearity. Yes. Okay. Uh, so my question is, is uh, what happens when you take kappa to be very, very small? What, what ah. I mean, what yes. happened with the, like the continuity between the nonlinear and the linear problem? What, 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 what breaks? Yes, yes. Uh, that, that, that's, that's a good question, yes. So I, 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 okay, that I, I maybe the, so unfortunately we only have this one stability result for when, for this um, that we did with with Lima and Tunian and and, and, uh, and later. Um, um, let's see. So the we we consider the signal that comes from the interaction. So the the the, the, the data that we use to solve the inverse problem that is actually multiplied by 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 kappa, or even maybe powers of kappa. So the 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 the, the same strength of the signal that we use gets gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So the the all the methods that we that we use to study this in the, the methods that we use to solve the inverse problem doesn't work. And then we are seriously we have serious problem with the case that for the linear equation the coefficients depend on time, and then we the basic method that we use to linear equations uh, fail. But that's a good question. So we don't know how this uh, term, the strength of the nonlinear term, how it uh, affects to the um, reconstruction, even though the only, only guess is. I see. Thanks. And, and I have one more question. Uh, so in, in all of this work uh, related to nonlinear equations, um, it's very common to assume that the source is uh, very small in size. So is that related to the existence of solutions or there is a more profound, uh, like another reason behind that uh, assumption? Thank you for the question. It is only to, to somehow say that the solution exists. Okay. Uh, like we did also some results to <coughs> inverse problems for Einstein equation. And there we, uh, we, we actually define the smallness in the way that uh, that we don't create singularity. So uh, the, our mismeasurement device shouldn't be so strong that it creates a black hole. So this is the criteria of smallness now mm -hmm. for inverse problem for Einstein equation. So you, uh, you're absolutely right that the criteria is only for the, to, to un be able to say that the, the, the direct problem has a solution. Okay, thank you very much. No, thank you. So, Mati, I also have a question. So, the three-point relation that you showed, this, uh, these uh, assumptions A and B, which hold for uh, the wave equation with u to the power of three? Yeah, okay. Um, do you know, do you have an idea? So, your, is your suspicion, sorry, did I understand it correctly? Is your suspicion that this holds more generally? I, I think we, it, it, like, like we can have any power, then we just have to differentiate the equation a little bit more. The right. point actually, the, the, I actually like simplified this a little bit. The, the exact definition is, is such that it, it helps the analysis part a lot. That um, the, you typically the problem is that um, when we have an unknown space time, then the, we don't know what when, when there is some kind of focusing phenomena. You would have a caustics or conjugate points. And, and the point is that uh, if in the paper, actually, the definition is such that we can we say that it is enough to study only the, the cases that happen before any caustics. Mm -hmm. We don't have any caustics. Uh, in the analysis, we don't have to have to worry about caustics. But that, um, then in this microcal school by Melrose, especially Anthony Sabaretto and, and his collaborators, they have studied lots of this uh, interaction. Uh, third order interaction of waves. And those results are enough. Uh, so so the, the, the typical results that they get, um, uh, like, like those are enough to somehow verify that this uh, A and B. This comes A and B are valid. Okay, 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 very interesting. 
Are there more questions? If you don't know how to raise your hand electronically, you can also chat. Okay, any questions from the panel? I think you gave a very clear talk, Mati. Oh, it was really you. interesting that people also need to digest uh, to think yeah. uh, about more questions. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Oh, well, um, thanks for organizing. This was really great. Um, it was super. Thank you, Mati. Um, so then we say goodbye. Maybe, Fadil, any, any last words from well, you? Well, we'll meet again next week. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember exactly who the next speaker is, but we will meet next week. Well, it will be uh, Bing Dong from uh, Beijing University. Oh, Bing Dong, yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Mati. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.